In this free course, I'm going to be simplifying ICT and smart money concepts into a few easy steps that will help you take your trading to the next level. You will learn exactly how to identify liquidity, which fair value gaps and order blocks to use, which chart timeframes you should be using for your trades, what time zones will you find the highest probability trades, and most importantly, my three favorite ICT entry models that will allow you to consistently trade, copy your trades, and get payouts just like this. If you're watching this, it's likely because you are seeing other traders who have implemented these models seemingly print money every single day. And if you're struggling to learn ICT because it's too confusing or because you don't have time, then this video is exactly for you. And before we get into it, if you want to trade live with us every single day, make sure you check out the link to the trading floor below. We go live at market open every single day. Many of our members were absolute beginners and they have taken their trading to the next level, knowing exactly when to enter trades and how to print money while minimizing the risk. And best of all, most of them are using the concepts that I'm going to show you in this video. Let's get right into it. All right, so the backbone of all ICT trading, really any efficient trading model is going to be liquidity, right? Liquidity is what drives the market. If this is something that has confused you, I promise you after watching this, just this portion of the lesson, you will understand liquidity better than you ever have. If there wasn't an, a disagreement between buyers and sellers, then the market would do what? It would just be a flat line, right? If if I agree that ES should be trading at 55.70 and you agree that ES should be trading at 55.70, the market wouldn't move. But the market moves because there is a continuous disagreement between buyers and sellers. Obviously, we do have algorithmic price action in institutions and large orders controlling the market. The small small fries like you and me, we don't control the market. What controls the market are large orders. In essence, what, when we talk about liquidity, we're talking about the draw on liquidity, okay? In this case, and, and by the way, you only need to know how to draw a horizontal line in order to identify liquidity. In a textbook sense, what would happen if price came to this area here, this line? which we're going to call our supply side or our resistance, right? If you are, if, if you have spent any time reading any sort of technical analysis textbooks, uh, you'll know that this is a resistance zone, right? This is the high right here. This is a potential resistance zone. What happens if price gets here? Well, you are taught in textbooks that this will uh, potentially create a double top, right? You have this top. And once we revisit it, we might get a, another top, all right? Let me make this line a bit thicker because right now it's hard to see. You might think that if we get here, we'll get a double top. Now, how many times, especially those of you beginners, how many times have you tried to short this only for your stop to get hit and then for price to continue in your direction? I bet you that's happened to you a lot. This right here is what we call a liquidity sweep right? This, this is the liquidity draw. This right here is the actual sweep. And the reason that this happens is because of this. Everyone and their mom can identify that there is a resistance here, right? We had a high here. This is a potential resistance area here. If everyone and their mom wants to go short here, well, what does that mean? That means that the market needs to find buy orders in order for, for them to get sold to because if you're shorting, that's a sell order, right? So if you're going to short from here, you need buy orders to take the other side of your order. Otherwise, there would be no way for you to go short here. You won't get filled. If everyone and their mom wants to short from here, where are the buy orders going to come from? No one wants to buy. Everyone wants to sell here. Well, when you set up a sell order there, right? That's the wrong one. Sorry. When you set up a sell order here, you likely put your stop limit somewhere up here, right? And you're hoping that this turns into a double top and that you can go short. Institutions, central banks, big players, uh, liquidity drivers, market makers, there's so many big players involved in, in the market. It's not just one big boogeyman, right? Hedge funds, they likely know that there's a lot of resting liquidity here, right? And what are these in the form of? They're in the form of buy orders in this case. They're in the form of buy orders. This is why we call this area here, we call this buy side liquidity, BSL, buy side liquidity, is the liquidity that is had above resistance, right? Or above your supply side. This right here is buy side liquidity. So once all of these buy orders get filled, now there's enough liquidity to take the market down. 
right? So us as traders, as smart money traders, this is the event we wait for. That's why for those of you that have seen me trade live or seen other people who trade SMC, you see them trade live. This is the event they're waiting for. And then they're looking for an entry in the form of a fair value gap or something after this happens. So this is the event we're waiting for. Same thing on this side. If this side is called buy side liquidity because these are buy stops, right? What is this side called? Sell side liquidity because these are sell stops, SSL, sell side liquidity. So if you take this low here, this last low here, and we're going to talk about which time, uh, which time windows to focus on, right? Like which lows and highs are significant. We'll talk about that in a second. So give me a minute. Let's just talk about the concept of liquidity first. This right here is our recent low. So what are you taught in textbooks? You're taught that once we get to this low, we might create a double bottom. If we create a double bottom, then there's a potential long here, right? But if everybody and their mom wants too long from here, where are we going to get our sell orders? Who's going to sell to us in order to long this? If everyone is instituting buy orders, where are all the sell orders? All the sell orders are here in the form of sell stops. Because if you wanna go long off this double bottom, right? You are likely going to put your stop limit somewhere here. And you're gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna go long off of here and I'm gonna put my stop limit here. Well, what does the market do? They know that that's likely the case. Your stops get taken out and then what happens? Stops get taken out, then it's time to run to buy side once again. This happens day in and day out. Obviously, you have periods of consolidation, which are also important. We're going to talk about that. This buy side sweep, sell side sweep, this is what happens day in and day out. And this is, as a matter of fact, what we are waiting for. We're waiting for the sweeps of either buy side or sell side. We're agnostic. We don't care which side gets taken out. We just want to recognize it so that when we, you know, when this finally gives us an entry model, and like I said, I will talk about entry models uh, later in the session. When this gives us an entry model, this is the first clue. The second clue is the creation of our entry model, and then we can finally enter a trade. But buy side liquidity and sell side liquidity, these are events that we are waiting for day in and day out. All right, so now let's talk about time windows, i.e. kill zones. Kill zones are basically where the most efficient price action lies and also where you should be drawing your levels based on. So we learned about liquidity. We learned about, you know, buy side liquidity, sell side liquidity. Buy side liquidity are is the liquidity that, that rests above resistance or above supply. And sell side liquidity is the, is the liquidity that rests below the demand zones or below support, right? But where do you draw these horizontal lines? Well, this is where the kill zones, the ICT kill zones come into play. So you can see here that Asia kill zones between 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. This is all Eastern time, New York time. London is between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. New York is between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. And London kill zone is between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Now, most of my trades occur here. That's it. I try not to trade in the p.m. session. Most of my trades occur here up until 12 p.m. We'll talk more about that uh, when we talk about setups. Also, it's important to keep note of the silver bullets and the macros, which I will explain uh, as, we, as we move along. So the Asia session is usually a consolidation session, right? And then we get a sort of breakout or breakdown during the London kill zone. And then and we get more consolidation between 5 a.m. and New York open. And then New York, there is another big move once New York open happens, okay? So let's go to the chart real quick and I'll explain this. So if you look at ES here, you could see that what is the high and low for London, right? When you wake up in the morning, where are you going to draw your levels? One of the levels you will draw is London high and low. This is the session right before New York. So between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., what is the high and what is the low? You can see here that between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., this right here was the high, which we took liquidity above already and are now uh, trailing downwards. And the low between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. is right here, right? And I have these templates in trading view, which you can easily create. So this is London low. This right here is London high. And as price, if price starts breaching this, I want to see if London is a draw on liquidity and if we get a 
retracement back up in order to find longs, right? Now, obviously, we're going to have to marry this with high time frame analysis and daily bias and whatnot. But just for simplicity's sake, I'm trying to explain kill zones as well as uh, how to look at liquidity levels, right? So in this case, if price continues to trade down, what do we have here? This right here, remember, between 8 a.m. and midnight is Asia session. So this right here is Asia low. So if we continue downwards and we don't retrace back up after taking London low, then the next logical liquidity draw is Asia low, right? We're basing everything off of these time zones here, these kill zones here. So what does price do here? Price takes out London, retraces back above. And when we talk about entry models, I'll talk about, you know, what would make me enter this trade long. So we already see price breached London low. And we have no idea yet whether price is going to continue to Asia or pop back above, right? So as price moves along, you can see here, we don't have any fair value gaps or, or anything that would warrant a, an entry here. You can see that price draws to Asia low. Now we want to see, is this the draw on liquidity or does price want to rally from here and what do we see here right we see that there is another low here this doesn't represent asia or london or any of the kill zones this is just a low based on the chart but ideally we also want to mark out what is the previous day low and the reason that we want to do that is because previous day low is another major level right so in this case uh previous day low you can see here is right here right? So I'm going to mark this out as well. Previous day lows right here, right? So what I want to determine is, is price going to continue past Asia down towards this interim low here, and then finally towards the major low, which is previous day low, or do we pop back above, right? So you can see here, and this right here, by the way, pay attention that this is market open, 9.30 a.m. now. So at 9.30 a.m., we swept Asia. This is actually a perfect trade. And you'll see why once we start talking about entry models. But at 9.30 a.m., this happens, right? At 9.30 a.m., this happens where we swept Asia low and we confirmed back above Asia low. And now, based on my entry models, we have an entry. And I'll talk about that when we talk about, you know, how it is that, that I enter trades. But this right here would be my, my entry. And you can see that price then just continued up, right, for, for longs here. When I say pay attention to these levels, these are the only levels you need to pay attention to, right? Asia high low, London high low, obviously the 9.30 a.m. open price, previous day high low, this week's high low, previous week's high low, previous month's high low, right? And you don't need to wake up and draw all these levels you know, before the market starts, you just need to draw the levels that are right in front of you, as you saw me do when, you know, I was talking about uh, London low and price kept going. Then I was talking about Asia low and finally price used that as the draw on liquidity. But if price continued down, then we would be talking about the previous day low, which is right here. Um, if price continued below that, then we are likely drawing to this week's low, et cetera. That right there is all you need to pay attention to in terms of which levels to draw your buy side and sell side liquidities at. That's it. You know, you don't need to know patterns. You don't need to know any of that. All right. Let's talk about everyone's favorite new revelation, the fair value gap. <laughs> I say that because you see on online all the time, people now just look at fair value gaps as if this is the only thing you could pay attention to. And they'll spot fair value gaps and try and trade every single one. The truth of the matter is this. Most fair value gaps are actually untradeable, meaning you should not trade most fair value gaps. And once you learn how to spot them, you're going to spot them all over the place. So I want to really focus on which fair value gaps to pay attention to. And you'll see in this presentation, you'll see that most fair value gaps are actually useless. And there are only a few that you should be paying attention to. So let's talk about what they are at first. A fair value gap is a three candle measurement. Remember the wicks count. Not every FVG means something and you cannot trade off of every FVG you're going to spot them everywhere, especially on the lower time frames. The lower the time frame, the more fair value gaps you'll see. Not only are fair value gaps used for entries, but also used to highlight potential obstacles against price. Meaning if you are in a trade and you are entering a major fair value gap, you might think of potentially taking profit or trimming some there. 
So here is a nice drawing of a fair value gap here. Now, this looks like a textbook drawing. We'll show you what it looks like on a real chart, but this is just a much easier way to illustrate this for the beginners. A fair value gap, as I said, is a three candle pattern, right? So you have the high of the first candle, the low of the third candle, remember wicks count, and that space in between is a fair value gap. This is in a bullish sense, right? In a bearish sense, the low of the first candle and the high of the third candle, that denotes the top and bottom of the fair value gap, which is the gap in between. Now, don't pay attention to the colors, meaning that all three candles don't have to be green in order for there to be a bullish fair value gap. And the same thing for bearish ones, all three candles don't have to be red for there to be a bearish one. This is just for illustration purposes. Let's go over to the charts and look at them in a real sense. So if you look at ES here, you can see that ES took liquidity from the morning candle, right? This right here was the 9.30 a.m. opening drive. And then we swept liquidity below that, right? Now, the first rule that I will say is in terms of fair value gaps, the most significant fair value gap is the one that's created after a liquidity sweep. So this is a potential liquidity sweep, right? You don't know that this will actually be a liquidity sweep until you actually see how price action develops, meaning, Sure, you can long this like a turtle soup type of long and take a shot at it and put your stop limit below this wick here. You can take a shot at that and it will be a high risk to reward play. But, you know, we're talking here about confirmation, fair value gaps, etc. So the way that, that you can determine whether this is a liquidity sweep in a high probabilistic sense is to see if it creates a fair value gap afterwards, right? Because price can easily just, if price wanted to, there's nothing that says that price can't just continue to trickle down. But once you see this wick here, that is the potential characteristics of a liquidity sweep. And after that, after that, that liquidity sweep, what happens here? We create a fair value gap. Remember, that in a bullish fair value gap, right? You have the bottom of the first candle, or sorry, the top of the first candle, the bottom of the third candle, and the space in between is the actual fair value gap. So that right there is a fair value gap. And not only is it a fair value gap, it is a valid one where trades should be searched for in this area. So if we trade back down to this fair value gap, you now can establish a potential two to one trade off of this fair value gap, right? You would set your stop limit below the low of the first candle and you would be targeting two to one here. If I'm being realistic, actually, this would be more of a one and a half to one trade. Yes, sure, you could target two to one. But just based on at least for this specific day, how price action is going, I would only be targeting this high here, right? The, the most recent uh, swing high after this price action. I would only be targeting this. So let's see what happens. And there you go. We actually did get uh, two to one here. You might have left runners for that target. But as I said, realistically for me, this would likely be a one and a half to one trade unless you did move your stop limit up to the low of this candle, a little bit more of a tighter stop, in, in which case this would be a two to one trade, either or. All right, here's another example. We can see here that we swept the low. This right here is during the London session between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Eastern. You can see here that we swept the low so far, and this happens to be during uh, London kill zone here, but we swept this low here. And again, there's nothing that says price can't just continue down, right? So what we want to see is, does this create a fair value gap or not, which would determine whether this is a liquidity sweep. And as we see here, what price ends up doing is we end up creating a fair value gap right there. So this right here is a tradable fair value gap because we traded below this liquidity zone, created a fair value gap on the way up, and you could actually set up a trade here, right? So if we, again, set our stop limit below the low of the first candle that created the fair value gap, uh, we want to see if we can realistically target two to one. In this case, we can. I would be targeting these highs here. But in this case, we can target two to one, which is below these highs, a little more conservative approach while still getting that two to one. You can set trades off of this fair value gap. So once what ends up happening here, that would have been an easy two to one there. We took a trade off of the fair value gap that was created after a liquidity sweep. Our two to one 
was very realistic because, like I said, we could target these highs and the two to one was uh, slightly below these highs. So that was a very conservative, realistic target that would have got you two to one. Now, what other fair value gaps count? So the fair value gap that's created after a liquidity sweep, in my opinion, is the most important one. The next fair value gap that's tradable is one that is played in, in the direction of the trend. So as you can see here, right, we did sweep this liquidity here and say you missed this, this trade here, right? If we are targeting this liquidity zone here, this, this recent swing high as the liquidity zone, you could see that after we swept this liquidity, we traded down into this fair value gap. Let's just say that you missed this. Is there a trade that you could take? Yes, you can trade a liquid, a fair value gap that is in continuation of the play that you were trying to make. So in this case, this fair value gap right here can be used as a potential entry point in order to ride the continuation if you believe that this is the draw on liquidity on the buy side. In this case, here is your fair value gap. I would say if you're a beginner, you would conservatively set your trades, the entry point in the middle of the fair value gap, right? As opposed to trying to set a trade at the top of the fair value gap. I would say if you're a beginner and you don't, and you're not really confident yet with regards to reading liquidity draws, et cetera, I would say make a habit, at least until you get better, of setting your entries in the middle of the fair value gap. And in this case, lower because it's a bullish fair value gap or higher if it's a bearish fair value gap, right? You actually have a pretty nice two to one here. Your two to one, you can target just the recent swing high and get a two to one off this, let alone target this, you know, most recent major swing high here, which would be a seven to one trade. I wouldn't necessarily target this trade with your entire position. If you enter multiple positions, you could take uh, one off at the two to one. You can leave a runner to get to the most recent major swing high. But the point of this is that the second most valuable fair value gap, in my opinion, is the one that is taken in continuation when you have your drawn liquidity set, uh, in this case, a lot higher. One other thing to focus on is are you in a discount or not? So you want to be longing in a discount and you want to be shorting in a premium. If we measure this and I go in here and I pull up the 0.5, right? You want to be taking trades. If, if this is my drawn liquidity, we drew liquidity here on the sell side. If this is my drawn liquidity on the buy side, meaning I'm expecting us to trade up there, um, you want to be longing in general in a discount, meaning that anything below the 0.5, and this would qualify, if it sets up, right? You don't just want to take blind longs there, but if it if there is something that sets up like this, then you can be comfortable longing in a discount as opposed to, you know, if a trade sets up here and this is your draw on liquidity, obviously, if you are an expert, you could still take it. But the likelihood of you getting a successful trade here is a lot less than if you are longing in a discount and vice versa. You want to be shorting in a premium. Now, why do fair value gaps happen? Uh, fair value gaps are basically an imbalance in the market that end up getting resolved because the market is driven on liquidity, right? So in this case, after liquidity is swept here and we create a fair value gap on NQ, essentially what that means is that there is a disagreement between buyers and sellers. So in this case, we have way more buying than, than selling, right? That propels the price up and leaves this inefficiency here. Now in this inefficiency, you still have quite a few buy orders. So if you look at something like Bookmap or one of these types of tools that shows you uh, the orders and the candles, you'll see that there are a lot of resting orders here, right? Um, that are That have yet to be fulfilled. So after the buying pressure at these prices, after the buying pressure pushes the price up and you have a bunch of unfilled orders here, the buying pressure uh, takes a little bit of a break here and selling pressure takes over a bit. Um, it is driven back down into this imbalance and this imbalance is then resolved. That's why you get a uh, fair value gap. So in theory, that is what fair value gaps are and that is why fair value gaps happen, right? So in this case, as you can see, um, 
the buying pressure was temporarily exhausted. Selling pressure took over until it hit that block again, where there's a huge inefficiency of a surplus of buy orders to then propel the market up. So that's why fair value gaps are created and that's why they're important. But as I said, you can't trade every single one. You can't just look at these fair value gaps and just start entering them willy nilly. All right, so let's talk about order blocks. What are order blocks? Order blocks are another form of imbalance or inefficiency, right? They are just another aspect of liquidity. We have, like I said, we have internal and external liquidity levels, which are basically horizontal lines. We have fair value gaps and we have order blocks. And trust me, when we talk about trade setups, we're going to be putting it all together. But it's important to understand what these things are individually before we start talking about them as a collection, right? Or how to use them. Now, order blocks, I am not I'm not an order block trader. There are times when I will look at order blocks and when we start talking about trade setups, I will talk about a specific entry model where I use order blocks, but in general, I personally don't trade just based off of order blocks. However, if we're just getting down to brass tacks of what is an order block, an order block is in a bear sense, in this case, if we're if you know we're looking if price is moving up and we're looking for where there is a potential bearish imbalance, in this case, it would be the green candle or consecutive green candles before a downtrend, right? So the last up close candle, or in this case, series of up close candles before a downtrend. Now, if all these three weren't green, say there was you know green, green, red, green then you would just count the last green candle or the last up uptrend candle as the order block. In this case, because these are consecutive green candles, this entire thing is an order block. When we're drawing bearish order blocks, we include the top wick of the green candle. When we are drawing bullish order blocks, you include the bottom wick of the red candle. So in this case, this entire thing is the actual order block here, right? Now, when we're using this for a trade or to de determine a target you in this case because we have three consecutive candles you have to use the mean or the middle of the order block right now again we will talk about trade setups using order blocks and, and putting all this stuff together but just in general as a concept right if we are targeting this order block you will have to use the mean of this order block because it contains so many different candles here, three consecutive candles. In the event that we have just one green candle here, right? So imagine that this this wasn't consecu three consecutive candles and this was the order block. The range is actually much narrower because we're talking about one candle. Now, it's important to note that order blocks on the high time frame are often fair value gaps on the lower time frame. So this right here, if we break this down, right? So again, this is the bearish order block here. If we break this down into the 15 minute, for instance, you'll see that there are a bunch of fair value gaps here, right? If you break it down to the one hour, you'll see the same thing, that there are a bunch of fair value gaps here. So it's important to note that um, what is an order block on a higher time frame might be a series of fair value gaps on the lower time frame. Now, like I said, I personally don't trade off of order blocks solely, but I do pay attention to them because I want to see if they are being respected or not. Here's what I mean. So say we have this four hour order block here, right? And say we are, are trading up into this range. This is on the NASDAQ four hour here. We're trading up into this range. I want to see if the NASDAQ respects this order block. And if it respects this order block, then on the lower time frame, I might be able to look for a bearish trade going the other way. So in this case, if we have a candle that trades into this order block, and remember, because we're dealing with this series of up close candles here as the order block and it is such a wide range i'm going to count the halfway of this order block the mean of this order block i'm going to count that if we hit that then i'm going to count this order block as mitigated and you can see here that we did actually trace retrace into more than than uh, than the actual mean and this order block can be considered respected and mitigated we wicked into it and came back, got rejected from it. So if you drill down to the five minute, right? In this case, you would have labeled this a four hour order block, right? So this is our four hour order block. That way you know what it is, even when you're trading down in the five minute, but we're trading into this order block and we want to see whether it is respected. 
And if it is respected, can we find a bearish trade uh, that potentially targets a, another liquidity imbalance below, right? So on the lower time frame, you could see if we create a fair value gap, and we do, right? We create a fair value gap right there. And this can actually be traded because this right here, like I said, this four hour order block is a major liquidity zone. So even if you know you might not be able to justify a trade down to sell side liquidity, right? Down to, to this area here, you can justify a trade, a shorter term trade to the next imbalance zone, which might be this fair value gap here, right? You could justify a if you could justify at least a two to one trade there, then you can take a trade here. You could take a stab at a trade here. So if we set our entry at the midway point of this fair value gap, we set our stop limit at the top of the first candle that created this fair value gap, and we draw out a two to one. If we do a two to one trade here, does it is it realistic? Is our two to one target realistic? And in my view, yes, because this is the next major imbalance below, which is this fair value gap. And our two to one is actually just barely in that fair value gap. So you could justify a two to one trade here, right? So I don't take trades um, off of, and, and there you go, filled the entire fair value gap. I don't take trades off of order blocks as soon as they're hit. Okay, I, I use them as areas of, uh, p uh, of liquidity where a potential trade setup can be had if on the lower time frame it then creates an inefficiency like a fair value gap or one of the entry models that, that I typically trade. Now, order blocks will come back into our lesson when I talk about entry models because aside from using order blocks in that way as a potential liquidity draw to then go to the lower time frames and, and find a trade, there is another way in which I use order blocks uh, for one of my preferred entry models. I have three entry models that I basically use for all of my trades, which we will talk about, right? And there are multiple ICT entry models. So as I said, this is not a comprehensive ICT lesson. There's no way that I'd be able to do that in one video. Uh, he's got, you know, hundreds of hours of videos, but there are three main models that I think if you know them, you really don't need any other entry models and you can make your bread and butter off of those. So order blocks will come back into the discussion when I talk about uh, those entry models. That's why we had to go through an order blocks explainer. So hopefully that that is clear so far and uh, we'll, we'll revisit order blocks. Now, let me just talk about timeframes real quick. In terms of timeframes, as I said before, the four hour and the daily is what I use mostly to determine high time frame and daily bias. Right. In order to enter trades, most of my trades are entered uh, either off the five minute, two minute or one minute. There isn't a magic time frame. There is no way to be like, when this happens, do this. It really depends on the entry models you use, what the price action delivers, how aggressive your entry models are, et cetera. Right. So, for instance, if if I am going to be trading off this liquidity sweep. Right. So let's say we took li sell side liquidity here. And I want to trade off this and I'm looking for a fair value gap so that I can enter. You can see here on the three minute or even the five minute that there are no fair value gaps offered, right? So what do you have to do for a more aggressive entry? If you want to really trade an aggressive entry and you really believe in your heart of hearts that this here is the liquidity sweep, you have to trade a very tiny time frame because remember, the higher the time frame, the more data is in that candle. When we go to a lower time frame, it breaks up that data into more candles, right? So in this case, if I trade, if I'm looking on the one minute and I'm an aggressive trader who is really confident in my drawn liquidity, and I believe that this is the drawn liquidity here, the liquidity sweep, and that we are going to go higher from here, I might want to find a much more aggressive entry on the lower time frame. And you can see here that off the one minute, we have a fair value gap after the liquidity sweep, right? If I was on the five minute, we don't have that. This just looks like a wick of nothing. Like we we swept liquidity and then we just had this wick here and there was no real entry model. Now, does it mean that I can't uh, be more prudent and enter off the five minute? No, it doesn't. You can enter the five, off the five minute too. It will be likely, it will be a later entry, right? So in this case, the five minute, the first time that we spot a 
uh, real fair value gap that we can trade off of is this one. We have the fair value gap. We have the breaker. I'm talking. I'm going to be talking about the unicorn model later and the breaker. So don't worry if that's confusing. But this is the real first fair value gap that that I could trade off of on the five minute, right? But a one minute trader could have traded off of here. The big difference is if you're a one minute trader, you will have more failed setups. You're going to be entering more trades but you will also have more trades that fail and you are okay with that because the risk to reward is a lot higher. So if you are okay with that, that's fine. And if you know how to read your drawn liquidity, because remember, I will say this time and time again, if you don't have a liquidity sweep or you don't have the drawn liquidity figured out, you don't have a trade, okay? You don't have a trade. You can enter this as a, as a one minute trader off of here, m more often than not, you're front running and so you will have more failed trades versus a five minute trader who doesn't enter here and waits for this, he or she will have less trades. And there could be a chance that price doesn't even retrace here, that price just continues up and you you know, waited for a more prudent five minute entry that didn't come. So that's just the reality of trading. You're going to have to live with the consequences of both. The consequences of trading with a five minute and up time frame is that you will have less entries and less setups that are presented to you, right? Because you have more data inside each candle and thereby you will miss more plays. And if you are trading a lower time frame, like a one minute, you're going to have more entries presented to you and more failed setups because you are likely front running the action. That's it. All right, so let's talk about high time frame analysis and daily bias and why this is so important. It's important to get a sense of where the market is going for the day to extract the biggest move. So obviously, if you're bullish for the day, you might be able to trade a much larger move than, say, a scalp or a tiny range. This also allows us not to trade against the trend. Obviously, this is self-explanatory and goes without saying. Now, there are various methods of cultivating your daily bias, which we'll talk about in a second, but the most commonly used timeframes are the four hour and the one hour. However, I will say this, the daily bias is not the end all be all, remember that, and you will often be wrong as I will show you examples right now on the high time frame charts of when you might have thought the day was bullish, but it ends up bearish or vice versa. So it's not the end all be all, and we will use the lower time frames as the day goes in order to be quick and nimble and potentially change our bias midway. So it's important to note that when you open up your charts during the trading day, at the start of the trading day, your daily bias a lot of times will not play out, right? Sometimes it will be very clear, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it will be in a consolidation for two weeks where your daily bias is just unclear until we get a breakout or breakdown. So it's important to note that it's not the end all be all. Now, Let's talk about the different ways in which we can try to acquire a daily bias. First one we'll talk about is candle structure. So what do I mean by this? If we take liquidity above a previous day or previous consecutive day highs, as we see here, right? If we take liquidity above and close below the previous day's close, then automatically you can assume that we are in a bearish flow, right? Now, this obviously can be a fair value gap that we trade into and then go back above. That can happen and you have to be ready for that. However, when I see this, when, when we do take liquidity and close below a previous day's candle, then in general, I'm going to be biased until something shifts. So as you see here, we take liquidity above the previous couple of days candle and then what happens for the next day or two is we end up in a bearish flow. Now, keep in mind, as I said, you will often be wrong on your daily buys. It's not it's not something that's just set in stone. So here, for instance, a very similar thing happened where we took liquidity above the previous day candle. We closed below the previous day candle. So you would expect to see a downtrend. However, this ended up being a period of consolidation, right? Where we basically had a few days that are trading in the same range until we get this candle. Now, what happens with this candle? We take liquidity. This is a very clear liquidity candle here, right? And it's denoted because of the wick below the previous day's wick. So we take liquidity below. We don't close above. So coming into the next day, you might have a slightly bullish bias because of this liquidity sweep right here. But you're not, it's not definitive because we did not close above uh, previous day's close, right? However, as you can see in the next day, we end up getting a couple of bullish days, right? So if you were not bullish here, uh, you certainly would be bullish here leading into the next day. 
The second thing that I look out for is imbalances, i.e. fair value gaps and order blocks. So if we look at the NASDAQ daily again, you can see here that we have a fair value gap. Now, it just so happened that this fair value gap is very narrow and we might need to go down a time frame in order to expand all of this, right? Because remember that with each uh, candle, the, the higher time frame that you go, uh, the more data is condensed in that candle. And if you want to see what's going on underneath the hood, sometimes you need to break up those candles. So this is on the daily. And on a day like this, I would then go to the four hour and see underneath the hood whether things are more clear. You can see here that this very narrow rectangle is where the daily fair value gap is. However, when we start expanding those candles, you can see a bunch of things going on here. You have this fair value gap, right? You obviously have a fair value gap above here and you have what's called a BPR because there's a, a fair value gap right here, but that's something else that, that we'll talk about in a later session. So if I'm looking at this as a trader, I have to think that we are at least drawing to this fair value gap, if not this one, right? Because remember, fair value gaps are also draws on liquidity. It's not just external liquidity or internal liquidity ranges. Fair value gaps and order blocks are also draws on liquidity. So it's very likely that if we are, you know, trading up from here, the draw on liquidity is at least this fair value gap, if not this one. And what ends up happening is that we end up trading to that fair value gap. So on the lower time frame, you'd be looking for trades to at least trade into this fair value gap. And then on the lower time frame, you would see where the liquidity draws are, how price action is forming to determine whether we trade up to this fair value gap or not. It just so happens, I think we end up trading up to that fair value gap, as you can see here as well. But the point is, that you know when we are here your daily bias would have to be looking for bullish trades in order to at least get to this liquidity draw which is the four hour fair value gap this is especially true after bouncing off of this four hour fair value gap right like once you see this you have to then be looking on the lower time frame you have to be looking uh for trades to at least take you here there is no foretelling that we are going to, to come to this fair value gap, right? But you have to look for trades to at least get to here. And then once you get to here, you might then reconfigure and try to establish a new daily bias or high time frame analysis. And the last method of determining high time frame analysis or your daily bias is looking at liquidity levels. So in this case, this looks like an obvious liquidity sweep. Now, could price just end up continuing downwards? Of course. So when this happens, and again, this is on the daily time frame, the following day, you would be looking to see if, if we do end up getting a continuation up and you could establish this by looking at the lower time frame as well, or could this be the draw on liquidity to take us higher? And sometimes you are not going to know, again, as I said, you're not gonna be able to foretell exactly what happens. You will have to corroborate what you see here with the lower time frame. So if you see this liquidity sweep on the high time frame, then on the lower time frame, you're gonna be looking for a unicorn setup or IFVG setup or something similar in order to justify a bullish trade here. Now, if there's no trade setup on the lower time frame, then sometimes you will have to wait until the next day's candle in order to establish that this is, as a matter of fact, a liquidity sweep before the market changes order flow to the bullish side. Just a little break in the video to let you know that we are now accepting applications for the next mastermind. This is our intensive mentorship program that is four weeks, eight classes taught by me. It's live, it is not recorded. We go over how to trade SMC concepts, how to do technical analysis on your charts, in depth as well as how to trade futures and how to enter and exit your trades and best of all if you are accepted as a student you get lifetime access to the discord and the trading floor where you get to trade with me every single day at market open forever back to the video all right we talked about liquidity concepts at in a basic sense right all you need to know how to do really is draw horizontal lines let's talk about the draw on liquidity so what is the draw on liquidity there is a liquidity sweep which is when liquidity is actually swept. So if you look at this, this right here is a sweep of liquidity, right? This is the four hour time frame. This is a sweep of liquidity before coming back down, right? Liquidity was swept here. Now, price is moving. Where is price going to? Remember, that's all we're trying to answer. Where's price coming from? Uh, from here, this sweep of liquidity. Where's price going to? Uh, to the next drawn liquidity. Well, what is a drawn liquidity? A drawn liquidity can be a number of things. 
you have external liquidity and different people will call this different things. So don't worry about, about the name so much. Let's just focus on the concepts, but external liquidity is key highs and lows, right? Major highs and lows, internal liquidity in the form of fair value gaps, order blocks, volume imbalances, inverted ver fair value gaps, etc. And then you have equal highs and lows, right? Equal highs and lows can also be liquidity draws. So if we look at this and we see that these highs, by the way, these were equal highs on NQ, on the NQ four hour, right? You have this high and this high. So these highs were also the all time high at that point, right? So a major high, equal highs at major high. Um, these were breached. This right here was a liquidity sweep. This was the draw on liquidity and it's confirmed by the price actually moving down. Now the price is moving down, right? If we are here and we are trying to determine our high time frame bias, right? And we're trying to de determine the draw on liquidity so that we can take trades on the lower time frame that support that. Well, you have a fair value gap here, right? But will price be drawn to here? The answer in my view, based on my experience is yes, most likely will be drawn to here, but there's nothing that will tell you that price is going to stop here and bounce. However, this is the draw on liquidity likely for this day, meaning that if you wake up and you're looking at this, you're like, oh man, I want to take a trade. Uh, I want to find trades that are potentially bearish that support at least getting to 50% of this fair value gap, right? Because remember, fair value gaps are mitigated at least if 50% is taken. If 50% isn't taken, the fair value gap is not considered mitigated. So in this case, price does trade into here, right? We can see that this fair value gap is respected, even though we wicked below here on this time frame that this fair value gap was created, the four hour, we wicked below, but the body closed above. So this is still considered respected, but mitigated already, right? This is already mitigated, meaning that if we trade out of here and we trade back in, or we trade out of here and we trade back in, it doesn't count anymore. This thing is, is this imbalance is solved, right? Now on this day, you know, where is your draw on liquidity? Well, you're drawing liquidity. We already, you know, got to, to this level, right? So where's the draw on liquidity? Well, you, you do have a fair value gap here, which price can get drawn to, but you also have equal lows here. Equal lows are a form of liquidity. So where does price want to go? Well, again, remember how we told you in terms of high time frame analysis, you will be wrong a lot because I don't know if today price wants to come down here and take liquidity here, or if price wants to come up and take liquidity here. There's no way for me to know except for to, you know, be on the lower time frames trading this um, when market opens and seeing if we get a, for instance, a, a liquidity sweep on sell side, potentially there are longs, or if we get a liquidity sweep on buy side, then potentially there are shorts. There's really no way to know just from looking at this, right? So we see that price uh, doesn't even come into that fair value gap, right? So this is what I'm saying. You can, you can be wrong a lot on draws on liquidity. And this is the four hours. So this is a high time frame. So price ends up drawing to here, right? Ends up drawing to these equal lows. So now this can be considered uh, a liquidity sweep here. And my draw on liquidity, this is still unmitigated. My draw on liquidity is still, I mean, my draw on liquidity, now that we swept this, right? We do have a tiny fair value gap in here. Tiny, 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 tiny fair value gap. But if this is surpassed, then based on what I'm seeing in front of me, my draw on liquidity, if, if we are to, to start trading upwards, would be this unmitigated four hour fair value gap. And there you go. Right. And if essentially what happened was price did come up, created this fair value gap. We traded down into it, which was the draw on liquidity for that time. And after bouncing off this, you know, once we established that we were still in bullish price action, your draw would have to be this immediate thing right in front of you. And by the way, we created equal lows here, which eventually I think will get uh, addressed. So for instance, if now we uh, start breaking down here, the question becomes, where's the drawn liquidity? If we are seeing bearish price action, well, the drawn liquidity would be these equal lows. However, we still have a, an order block here. So price can continue up, right? And again, there's no real way uh, to know. There you go. Price did continue up, took out this, uh, this order block and we rejected off of it, right? But there's no real way to know for sure every single day. You can only make an educated guess in terms of high time frame, and then go to the lower time frame and see if you have a 
a liquidity sweep like this one that happened right after market open. We had this liquidity sweep in here, which at that point you would then use your entry model knowledge, which I will talk about later, uh, to look for potential shorts. But now for all intents and purposes, uh, this is the most current price action. So I don't, I don't have anything beyond this, uh, but my draw on liquidity would essentially be this interim low followed by these equal lows, right? So once this interim low is taken, then I want to see if price action pops back above, in which case this interim high would be my draw on liquidity. Or uh, if it continues, then I would wait to see if these equal lows are my draw on liquidity. But that's it. The market is just a series of taking liquidities. Liquidity here, liquidity here, liquidity here, liquidity here, liquidity here. And that's how the market zigzags and moves. Now, let's talk about silver bullets and macros, right? Th this will be extremely poignant once you know how to enter trades, which we will talk about uh, trade entries. But let's talk about silver bullets and macros. What are they? They're it's actually really easy. There are basically time windows where the theory goes that algorithmic trading occurs during those those time windows, right? It's not going to tell you whether you are long or short. You still have to determine where the draw on liquidity is, meaning whether you are targeting buy side or sell side liquidity, right? But during these time windows, you will usually find that if there is a trade setup, these time windows are super important. So let's talk about silver bullets first. The theory behind silver bullets is that during the silver bullets, there will be at least one optimal trade that will give you a two to one setup for a certain number of points, right? But you will get an optimal setup between these silver bullet timeframes. There's one that occurs between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m., which is London silver bullet. There's the New York a.m. silver bullet between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. And there's the New York PM silver bullet between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. It doesn't mean that there aren't trades outside of this. It just means that there are there is going to likely be one very high probability trade during these time frames, right? And then the macros is these are are basically short time windows where you have algorithmic boosts in price. And by boost, I don't mean necessarily up. I just mean that there's usually a distribution move, whether up or down, depending on the setup. So if you're short, if you're short and you happen to be within a macro time frame and you have all of the characteristics of an A plus short, then and it happened and you know one of these macros is upcoming, then likely if you are right on your thesis during these times you will get an algorithmic delivery in price to go your way same thing if you are long so in this example here where we took out asia low and you went long if you were here and price was consolidating and we hadn't yet hit the 950 macro because if we look at this you can see that there's a macro between 950 and 1010 well what happens here between 950 and 1010 we're consolidating after sweeping liquidity, we're consolidating. And, you know, once we swept Asia low, hopefully you guys uh, know or will get good enough to know that this that longs are in play here. So what happens when we hit that macro window? You can see that price algorithmic algorithmically delivers between 950 and 1010 is right here. And go back and test this over and over again on liquid pairs like NQ or in this case ES, you could see this type of algorithmic price delivery, right? So the goal is to be able to catch a an optimal setup between either during the silver bullet time window and or right when the macro is about to hit, right? Now, I want you guys to, it's, it's important to note that it's, it's not that between you know these these macro time windows you're always going to get distribution but if there is a trade setup meaning if you, if we already have a liquidity sweep which is the backbone of every trade setup if we have a major liquidity sweep especially if it's above or below these major high lows then during the the macro time window this algorithmic price distribution can help your setup if your draw on liquidity is identified correctly. I hope that makes sense. Now, it's important to note that AM session is definitely cleaner than PM session, and I personally don't trade lunch. So between 12 and 1, I usually will not take a trade, okay? Most of my trades occur between 8.30 New York time and 11 a.m. New York time. Most of my trades will occur there. 
All right, moving on from order blocks, let's talk about a specific kind of order block because this is going to uh, really come into play in an entry model called a unicorn, but a breaker block. Right. This to me is the most important kind of order block, at least for the way that I trade in my entry models that I use. But a bullish breaker block starts with a low, a high, lower low and a higher high. And it is the green candle or consecutive green candles that occur in between that. Right. So low, high, lower, low, higher, high. This right here is your bullish order block. Right or bullish breaker block. And it's called the breaker because we essentially break market structure. So once we trade back into it, it becomes a bullish PD array. And it's made ever more powerful if it's nested inside a fair value gap. So in this case, you do have the bullish uh, breaker block and here you have a fair value gap. This right here is called a unicorn model, which we'll talk about later in the show. A bearish breaker block starts with a high instead of a low, right? High, low, higher high, lower low, and it's the red candle or the down close candle in between there, right? In between the high, the first high and low. So high, low, higher high, lower low, you have this down close candle. Once we trade back into it, it's called a bearish breaker block. And again, if it's nested inside a fair value gap, there's the fair value gap, there's the bearish breaker block, or other words, if the FVG is inside the breaker block, either way, this is called a bearish unicorn, right? So you have the liquidity sweep, the key to every trade, liquidity sweep, buy side, right? This is buy side liquidity, as we learned. BSL, wow, that's horrible. Came back down, created a bearish breaker block. After the liquidity sweep, we also created a fair value gap and we traded back into it. This is a bearish unicorn. All right, so how do we use these concepts in order to enter trades? Like when we know what to look for, how is it that we actually enter trades? Well, as I told you, I'm going to be discussing my three favorite entry models. These are the only trades that I take day in and day out in terms of day trades. I don't take any other day trades. In my view, you don't need any other entry models. So in this case, let's hypothetically start off as if this was our daily bias. This is on the NASDAQ. Now, the problem with this setup here, and this is what you will encounter in a real life environment, in a real life scenario, we really don't know what the draw on liquidity is. We don't have a clear high time frame bias. These equal highs were swept. Okay, fine. We had three days of downward price action, and then we retraced back up into this daily fair value gap. We also left equal lows behind. And what do we know about equal lows and highs is that eventually they will get drawn to and liquidity will get swept here. However, do we know if price is going to continue upwards past this, I mean, towards this four hour order block here on the NASDAQ, right? Do we know if price is gonna continue upwards to that four hour order block or is price going to get rejected off this daily fair value gap and come down and sweep these lows? There's really no way to know except for when you are trading in the lower time frame. meaning I open this at the beginning of the day and I say to myself, price can either get drawn to this order block up here and continue up past ignoring that daily fair value gap into that order block up there, or price can get rejected off of this daily fair value gap and take out these lows. It could do both. How would I know? I don't. The only way that I would know is if I'm trading on the lower time frame. So what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for a sweep of liquidity. So when I approach the charts, after the market opens, let's just let it get close to market open and uh, we'll continue the conversation. All right, so we're nearing market open. We The market open, and this right here is the daily fair value gap, right? So we would mark that out, DFVG. This is the daily fair value gap. And we could see that price did come into it. However, it did not take the mean of this daily fair value gap, the middle, right? This uh, purple line here. And a fair value gap can't be considered mitigated unless at least 50% of it is taken out. So in my view, when I see this, there are a couple things you could do here, right? You can take a trade off of this fair value gap right here, right? Because we know that the draw on liquidity is uh hasn't been taken on the buy side so if we if we think that you know the drawn liquidity is still has to be 50 percent of this fair value gap we can take a long off of this fair value gap to trade it to this fair value gap and when that's hit 
then we can consider that a potential liquidity sweep and we'll have to go from there. So, you know, you can set up a trade here where you're taking it from halfway of this fair value gap to halfway of this fair value gap. And we'd set our stop limit at the bottom of the first candle that created this one, two, three, this fair value gap. And you have a two and a half to one trade. So let's see what happens here. Okay. So our two and a half to one trade hit, we took out the mean or 50% or what ICT calls CE, consequent encroachment, doesn't matter. But we took out half of, at least half of this fair value gap. Now, price can continue up here, okay? And either mitigate all of the fair value gap or even ignore it. Um, so at this point, there is no trade because there's no draw on liquidity, right? So what we can do is drill down to an even lower time frame and see if this is in fact the draw on liquidity, then price uh, for the day at least, then price will likely reject off of here somewhere um, if it creates a fair value gap or some sort of imbalance. And the next target can be the last major low, the last swing low here that we see here, right? So let's see if the market gives us any sign here. Um, if we look at the one minute chart, not only is this considered a liquidity sweep of this buy side, but this we know is the daily fair value gap. So uh, we can go into the one minute if we don't see any fair value gaps. Remember, we use time frames in order to gain clarity and we use them in a practical manner. I'm not just cycling through random time frames or there isn't a rule that says, if this happens, look at the three minute. If this happens, look at the two minute. That doesn't exist. It you have to try to create a story as a chartist in terms of liquidity and imbalances, right? So if we swept this liquidity here and we took out the daily fair value gap and I'm potentially looking for shorts, if none of these timeframes are offering me a fair value gap that I can likely take a trade from, then I will have to you know, cycle down to the smaller time frames in order to take a trade from here. Now we have this liquidity sweep and you can front run this because you have a high risk to reward here you can front run this you have a fair value gap here that's only apparent on the one minute remember we're cycling time frames in order to um gain clarity and a narrative so you see this fair value gap you can actually trade this you can front run this and your two to one is is right here but in my view if this is a liquidity sweep the next swing low you should aim for is this one this one and then eventually this one right so this gives you a four and a half to one this is worth taking any day of the week all right. So in this case, if this is the liquidity sweep, then price should not go higher than this. It should stop at this fair value gap and continue until we get to at least this internal liquidity zone. Right. So let's see what happens here. There you go. Right. So there would be your first profit target. You could obviously take uh, profits entirely there. And remember what I said about fair value gaps that you can trade continuation fair value gaps as long as the trend is in your favor and you have the story on liquidity properly. So if I thought that this was the liquidity sweep on buy side, and I think that the potential draw is here and here, right? Does that give me an optimal trade? Let's see if we traded from half of that fair value gap, the stop limit is above the first candle that created the fair value gap. This would be the profit target. Yeah, this is almost a three to one trade. I would take this every single time. Now, we didn't get a, an entry here and that's okay. That's gonna happen to you in live conditions. So this would have been a trade setup that I would have taken, but we didn't get a retracement and that's fine. There's nothing you could do about that. So now in this case, uh for me if i wasn't still in the original trade or at least had some contracts left from the original trade uh this trade would likely be off the table here now you can try to trade this fair value gap but we already hit a major internal liquidity zone and here you would be shorting in a discount remember if we create the range of the day starting this low and this high we are now in a discount we're below the 50 percent range right? So we'd be shorting in a discount and we already took out major internal liquidity. So I personally would not short this. I would say that this trade is done for. So the first entry model here is a sweep of liquidity, a creation of a fair value gap after that sweep and an entry based off of that fair value gap, right? That's it.
That is the, the first entry model. I'm actually curious to see what happens here. Let's see what happens here. Do we actually get down here or is this the sweep on liquidity before going back up? Let's see. Eventually we do get down there. Eventually we do get down there. Interesting. But that would have been a suboptimal trade that I would not execute in live conditions. For me, I need to be involved or at least be able to monitor the liquidity sweep. And I want to be involved in a trade that happens after the liquidity sweep. Okay. All right, my second favorite entry model is uh, a model that's usually to be had at market open. It's a, it's a model that's usually to be found at market open, right? So if we look at NQ here, this right here is London low. It's a low between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. So let's just go ahead and mark that. And what happens is at market open, you will see a low. Th this happens on most days. You will see a low that's right in front of your face. In this case, it happens to be London low. But it's important to remember this. It doesn't have to be London low or Asia low. It could just be the most apparent and recent swing low. So what happens here, let's just fast forward to market open. We see that at market open or right before market open, we traded into London low. So this is our potential sell side liquidity sweep. Remember, and I will continue to beat the drum about this to beat it in your heads. Every A plus trade starts with a liquidity sweep. Every single one. Okay. So in this case, uh, we took out London low. Now, could we just continue to trade lower until we get to, you know, a low that was formed yesterday? Yes, of course we can. We can continue to trade lower and we don't know. We don't know until we get confirmation. So my opening play, my, my market open aggressive play or entry model. This is the second entry model that I used. The first one I showed you was a liquidity sweep plus fair value gap. This is the second entry model, right? It's usually a market open play after a major low has been taken. This one is exclusively taken off of the one minute. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for an inverse fair value gap or a fair value gap to be traded above. So in this case, you guys know what a fair value gap is, right? You might not know what an inverse fair value gap. It's nothing different. It's just a fair value gap that gets ignored. So if this was truly a bearish fair value gap, then we would trade into it and continue lower, right? But this right here is a fair value gap that eventually gets traded into and surpassed and closed above. So if you look at this, we close above this fair value gap. This is the hallmarks of an aggressive opening entry that can provide you the biggest move of the day. And this is my second favorite entry of the day, right? Actually, they're not really ranked. I'm just giving you the three entry models that I use. So in this case, this is exclusively traded off the lower time frame. Most of the time will be the one minute. The liquidity story has to be there. Remember this white line is London low. And it's usually, it, it occurs right after or right around market open. So we power of three into here. You have the consolidation, you have the manipulation, and now we are expanding up, right? And you can see that the fair value gap was closed above. Now the entry model, because it's an aggressive one, it calls for an entry right at the closure of the one minute candle above this fair value gap, right? And the better you get at it, the more you will recognize this candle early and can potentially front run it, right? Uh, because this right here is the fair value gap. Once this candle starts trading above and you know, the, you'll see in, uh, in trading view, there will be a timer here showing you how many seconds are left until the candle closes. You could, you'll be able to tell that with a couple seconds left until the candle closes or whatever, you can likely enter. You don't have to wait for it to close as long as it's apparent that we're going to close above this fair value gap right? Or you could just wait for it to close. And the minute it closes, you enter your trade, you set your stop limit below the low of the inverted candle, uh, inverted FVG middle. So this red candle here, you would set, set your stop limit there. And usually you could target the most recent swing high, right? This is a very aggressive entry that typically is given right around market open. Oh, and one more thing that I wanted to say about this is you can ladder your entries, meaning a lot of times you will get even this close above the fair value gap. Sometimes you will get a trade into that inverse gap. You can wait for that, a trade into the inversion gap. A lot of times it won't be given to you. 
meaning that you there is a chance that if you wait for that, and that's fine if you do, by the way, but there's a chance that you will miss the trade. So in my view, you should enter maybe MNQ contracts. If entering multiple NQ contracts is too much for you, you should enter MNQ and ladder them where you would enter half here and half here, right? It all depends on, on your budget. But in this case, this is a three to one trade right here. Let's see what happens. <laughs> there you go. So price ends up at that swing high and you would actually be done for the day right now it's interesting for those of you that have been paying attention if you noticed this also created a fair value gap right here so even if you weren't in tune with the you know inverse fair value gap um and all you knew was the first model that i showed you where you have a liquidity sweep and then after the liquidity sweep we create a fair value gap your entry would be right here so that's entry model number two which is an IFVG entry around market open. Now, this for this entry model, the number two one, the IFVG one, you can enter it at other times other than market open, but it has to be a major, major liquidity sweep. It can't just be in the middle of the range or whatever. So for instance, if this right here was swept and we got an inverse gap on the way down, then you can potentially enter it, right? But you can't just enter every IFVG in, in the middle. You can't just pick a random IFVG and enter it. The only IFVGs that matter are the ones after major liquidity sweeps, right? And remember, don't ignore this. Make sure that you are trading during opportune times here. All right, and my third favorite entry model is called a unicorn model. What is a unicorn model? A unicorn is just a breaker and fair value gap combo, right? A, break, a breaker block and fair value gap combo. So if you look at ES here, you can see that ES swept liquidity here, right? You can see this is a clear liquidity sweep here. And as we near New York open, you can see that we created a fair value gap right here, right? And you guys know from this lesson, that the best fair value gaps are the ones that are created after liquidity sweeps. Now, if we can get a set of confluences, not as in not just trade the fair value gap, if there are other things that tell us we can enter this trade, uh, that would help as well, right? So we have the fair value gap, we have the liquidity sweep, which is the beginning of every single trade. We have to know what the liquidity story is and preferably you enter close to a liquidity sweep. We, uh, in this case, we actually even broke market structure which is something we haven't really talked about much in this we broke market structure as you can see here and we created a fair value gap so we retraced into the fair value gap but we also have a couple of other things here you have an inverted gap you can see here right the inverted fair value gap you also have a breaker remember we have a lower low oh, sorry we have a low a high lower low which was the sweep and a higher high so this candle right here set of candles right here is the breaker these green consecutive candles here, right? So let's mark that out. So we have the fair value gap nested inside the bullish breaker. This right here is a trade, an A plus trade after the liquidity sweep. This right here is an A plus trade. So we would set our stop below the candle that created the fair value gap, or sorry, at the low of the candle that created the fair value gap right there, right? Our entry is going to be at the 50% of the breaker, or for a more aggressive entry, it could be the fair value gap, or for an even more aggressive entry, it could be the top of the breaker, right? Some days, if, if you have it too conservative, like in the middle of the breaker, you won't catch it. Uh, some days, if you put it at the top of the breaker, it will trade all the way down to the end of the breaker, right? So you have to be prepared for everything. There's no way to know. The only thing you can do is control the risk to reward of your trade. So let's just say that even if you entered at the top of the breaker, this is your two to one. Well, let's see, you do have London low right here, right? Remember, it's a low between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Um, and you do have London high right here, right? And on, on any given day, like you're not going to know the exact levels. You just have to know what is in front of you. So, you know, worst comes to worst, if you did enter at the top of the fair value gap, and let's say London low was the draw, this is not giving you a two to one. So you'd have to move your entry uh, to at least right there in order to give you a two to one. And that's what I would do in, in live conditions. So even if there are parameters that allow you to enter, or trade once you scope out where's a realistic exit if it's not at least two to one or whatever risk to reward you use 
um, then you're going to have to lower your entry. There's no other way around it, right? You can't just every trade target the top level all the time because that's not how the market works. So in this case, uh, we entered there. Our stop limit is there. Let's see what happens. I mean, basically, I would have exited the trade. I wouldn't be a dick for a tick, but just for funsies. There you go. So two to one was hit. London low um, was uh, at least our draw, right? I am not sure what happened afterwards. Market was kind of shifty here, but did we eventually get up to London high? Maybe after market closed. Yeah, market is closed now. And no, we don't get to London high until following days. Um, doesn't matter. But anyway, that's this is essentially the entry model, the unicorn, right? The unicorn being the breaker uh, nest or the fair value gap nested inside the breaker after a liquidity sweep. And remember in the morning, as I said before, like, yes, we draw London low, we draw Asian low, uh, previous day low, if we have to. But a lot of times in the morning, the low is the, the liquidity sweep ends up being the low that's the, the major low that's right in front of you. So in this case, this can end up being the liquidity suite for the day. And this is not, this is not London low. We are already trading well below London low, right? This is just the low that occurred before market opened, right? We can obviously look at this as an extension of breaking below this low, which is a major low, right? So we broke below this low and then created a new low. But either way, this entire thing can be considered a liquidity sweep. One of the things I used to do was obsess every morning, right? I'd wake up and I would see a liquidity sweep, but it would just be a major low that was taken. And it, you know, wasn't London low or wasn't uh, Asia low, but it would, it would look like a liquidity sweep in, in the sense that, you know, we, we would get a major wick below. We would on the lower time frame create these fair value gaps and these inverted fair value gaps. And I still wouldn't enter. Cause I'm like, no, I'm taught to wait for London low or I'm taught to wait for Asia low. And a lot of times at market open, you'll see that, you know, especially like in this case, we were already trading below uh, London low, a seemingly random low, right? Even though visually you could tell that this is the major low on the chart um, can be the draw. So I've, uh, you know, sold myself out of a lot of entries because I was waiting for a major low as opposed to just being like, oh, this is just a random low from Thursday lunch. Yeah, but look at it. Like it's clearly a major low on the chart. So, you know, if we do take liquidity below it and we have our criteria that we use to enter, that can be a trade. All right, I wanted to talk about power of three because power of three is a characteristic in price action that really helps you to find the most optimal and broadest trades, okay? So power three happens on all time frames, okay? But power three basically is accumulation, manipulation, and then the real move, right? Distribution. So this would be a uh, accumulation here, right? Consolidation. And the fake move would be to the upside, drawing in all of the liquidity, but the real move would be to the downside, right? So this is would be a bearish power of three and a bullish power of three is exactly the opposite consolidation, you have a manipulation to the downside, and then the real move, okay, this happens every single day on every time frame, and will help you find entries because if you can find like if you can spot the consolidation and you find the manipulation happening in a major PD array or major liquidity zone. So, you know, a major high and low, a fair value gap, an order block, uh, et cetera, right? Then you can potentially find a trade to the other side. And this happens every day. So for instance, if we're looking here at the NASDAQ, right? You can see that we are in a, you know, potentially bearish fair value gap. And we also have a order block here right? Essentially what we want to see, it doesn't have to happen, but it, it can present you with really optimal trade entries if it does. Essentially what we want to see on the lower time frame is a manipulation to the upside, either to, you know, fill this entire fair value gap here, since we're still in it and then down, or even better into this order block here, which would provide a much bigger move and then down. Right. So if we look at the small at the uh, at the 15 minute time frame, we were just on the four hour. You can see here what price does. We have the accumulation here. We manipulate into that order block that right there is a manipulation phase. So if you can identify the correct drawn liquidity and you incorporate it in this power of three 
identifying this power of three, then you can trade the move down. In this case, you know, you would be trading a much more uh, aggressive entry. So a, you know, like a lower time frame trade. In this case, you do have a fair value gap here, uh, as well as an order block, as well as an inverted gap here. So you might take a trade from here you know, to ride it to the, the bottom of that consolidation, for instance, and there you go. Uh, the funny thing is this, this actually didn't even give an entry, right? Like not off the three minute, uh, would it have given an entry off the one minute? Even then there was this tiny fair value gap here. And if you didn't catch that, uh, good luck, but either way, the point still stands, right? Like I, I wouldn't have caught this trade in all honesty, um, at least not from the top, but either way, the point still stands that, you know, you have your consolidation. We manipulate into that high time frame order block. And it's clear that after that, it's the power of three is clear. And after that, um, you can target the accumulation lows, which is right here. And like I said, it could be seen on all time frames. So even here, you could see that, you know, you had these equal highs and price was accumulating. This is on the four hour and we popped above accumulation. And what happened thereafter, right? You have accumulation, you have the manipulation above, in this case, the PD array that it was targeting was the equal highs right and the major high there we took liquidity above and then the real move was to the downside so this right here was a, manipul a manipulative move so po3s can be seen on all time frames and if you can marry your po3 with what you're seeing in terms of uh, liquidity, right? If the manipulation phase ends up uh, hitting a major liquidity area, then those usually make for the biggest and cleanest trades. That is it for this video. I know it was a ton of information. I applaud you guys for sticking through it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. I try to answer each and every question or better yet, why don't you join the trading floor, join the Academy and chat with me every single day. I go live at market open and then I go to the discord chat and I'm there all day basically trading with the rest of the group. So I will see you there if you decide to join. Otherwise, leave it in the comment section below. Give this a big fat thumbs up if you got anything out of this video. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Stay safe out there, traders. Peace.